Hello, everybody. This is Alan Fulton, uh, Farm Advisor, um, Irrigation and Water Resources Farm Advisor up in Red Bluff in Tehama County. Uh, welcome to the third tutorial on using the weekly crop ET reports, put, putting them to work for you. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to use them and how to relate them um, from, from a tree perspective. Uh, before I dive in, uh, I think uh, uh, I'd like to uh, remind you that uh, you've been on, by default, you've been put on mute uh, to help us to control background noise. Um, we're gonna ask that you use the chat um, box for questions, communication. Um, uh, Catherine Jarvis Sheen, Farm Advisor from Yolo County will be our chat moderator. So if you have questions, She'll be watching for them and letting me know, and we'll take certainly take time for your questions. Um, Want to welcome Luke Milliron, Farm Advisor from Butte County Orchard Crops Advisor. Uh, Luke's with us today, and um, we're going to be talking on some subject matter that he's very well acquainted with. And if I'd like to welcome him if he has comments, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, join in. I um, want to say thanks to Clint Zhu and Rachel Palmer uh, with our program support unit at Davis for helping us set this up and helping all of you make connections as needed. And so uh, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so this is a, an ongoing series. Um, we started back in early April, April 3rd. It was our first experience with a Zoom virtual meeting. And our first meeting was kind of keeping it real basic. Uh, the focus was on the weekly ET reports that we send out by email or that you can re uh, go online and find. Uh, the focus was on how to read the tables, navigate them. There are two different kinds of tables uh, depending on whether you want to account for irrigation efficiency or not. And there are also uh, several subsets of tables that are based on weather measurements measured at different weather stations throughout the Sacramento Valley. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about how to convert ET estimates to other units that might be more meaningful and kind of working back and forth, introducing you to some calculators that are available online at our Orchard website. Uh, and at the end, uh, we talked about how to relate a weekly ET estimate to your specific irrigation system um, to calculate an irrigation set time. Uh, if you did not see the first tutorial, you can uh, see the video at YouTube video and the PowerPoint at the links shown here. The second tutorial was just about 12 days ago. Uh, Again, we, we talked about how to use the weekly ET reports to relate those uh, estimates to your orchard soils, to your crop uh, uh, water holding capacity of the soils you're growing your crop. Um, it's important to ha consider that soil's perspective, especially if for us growing in the Sacramento Valley where our rainfall is higher. Um, many, many seasons we have a bank of moisture that can help us to save on irrigation. And if we don't account for it, it, it can put us at risk for over irrigating our crops. Uh, we uh, talked some about how to pair together a water budget and actual soil moisture sensors and getting the best out of both to help them have them complement each other. And um, ended up discussing a little bit of how to adjust for different irrigation wetting patterns. Uh, depending on whether you're using drip, a partial micro sprinkler system, or a full coverage solid set irrigation system. And again, here's the video links, the YouTube link to hear the, the video, and uh, here's the link to the PowerPoint from that tutorial number two. Um, today, as I said, we're going to continue to talk about how to use the crop ET reports, but in this instance, we're going to try to relate it to, to the tree perspective, to the tree water, plant water status of, of your crop. And so here are the kind of the four sections that I'll talk about today. 
why consider the tree plant perspective? Um, we'll make the connection between the soil moisture depletion that we estimate with our um, uh, weekly ET reports, make, the, make that connection between the soil mo estimated soil moisture depletion and tree water status. We'll talk a, a share time on measuring tree plant water status directly. And then we'll finish up with um, uh, talking about and, and looking at some case studies where we, we use both the water budget and uh, the direct measure of tree water status together. So with respect to the first topic, why consider the tree or the plant perspective? Um, it boils down to it's the tree health and the productivity that is that we care about the most. That's ultimately our goal. Um, both the water budgeting approach with our ET, our weekly ET reports, and soil moisture monitoring with our soil moisture sensors are indirect indicators of crop water status. And um, I'll expand on that a little bit more later. Um, one of the biggest challenges when we're trying to assess crop water status using indirect methods is the uncertainty that we can run into about the effective crop root zone, how deep it is and, and, and how much root, root volume is there and how the water is distributed through that root zone. Uh, when we are able to consider the the tree water status, it's sometimes possible to um, actually experience benefits of moderated or managed water deficits. You're otherwise irrigating less than ET. Um, so <clears throat> some possible benefits of well-timed and managed water deficits are better overall tree health, uh, better orchard uniformity, uh, sometimes when orchards are in their younger years or kind of their juvenile years, the, the later oh, seven, 10 teens kind of thing, um, we can get areas where we have very vigorous, strong growing trees and we can get intermingled with uh, sh smaller, not so vigorously growing trees. And that difference just accentuates over time. And so um, using some uh, manage water deficits, we can possibly manage that a little better and create more orchard uniformity. Uh, with managed water deficits, we can uh, reduce water and energy costs, uh, energy costs both in terms of the cost of pumping water, uh, but also sometimes it will affect our processing costs of the products that we produce. When we think about uh, using managed water stress or managed water deficits, we do need to be aware that in some, in some instances, salt buildup can be a potential concern. Um, but fortunately in the Sacramento Valley, we're generally, um, with the exception of the rare extreme drought year, um, we generally get enough rainfall that helps us to control that issue. So here's some specifics with respect to almonds, some of the benefits of managed water deficits. Um, we can uh, uh, con uh, manage our water uh, mid-season so we have less hull rot in almond. It can help us uh, 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 create a more uniform hull split, which helps us uh, assist us in timing our sprays to con con uh, control navel orange worm. Um, it can lead to more uniform hull split and maturity of the crop across the orchard, so more efficient harvest. And when, when we have less hull rot, have uh, better control and more efficient harvest, ultimately we're able to get through the harvest season earlier and return to the post-harvest irrigation and really, really, uh, more effectively uh, relieve uh, um, that, that post that harvest time stress that it, as well, the nuts are being harvested and drying on the ground. In walnut, we've seen instances where we can certainly use managed water deficits to control tree vigor with during the years uh, when we want to um, control our during the years when we're training the trees. Uh, there may be some instances where we're trying to manage light light penetration for managing things like botrysphere or that might uh, uh, play into this. 
Um, we've done research that's showing that when we uh, use um, water deficits, um, modest uh, water stress delays in the startup of irrigation, we can encourage the tree to adapt and, 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 and increase its hardiness, which uh, later on has proven to play out in the form of less tree stress at harvest time. Uh, and then we're seeing some instances in production that in walnut, we can actually uh, improve edible kernel with some uh, well-timed, uh, mild controlled water stress. In prune, it's pretty well known that in prune, that uh, towards the last couple of weeks leading into harvest, if we use water deficits, we can increase the sugar content of our fruit. Um, and when we take the fruit, to the dryer, we can reduce our drying costs at the drying plant. So uh, there's a lot of reasons to consider the tree perspective. And I'd like to put on the table that uh, uh, using the combination of ET-based weather water budgeting and monitoring tree plant water status is, is potentially a very powerful decision tool for us. And I'll uh, try to speak to that in, in our case studies a little bit. Okay, so to make the connection between soil moisture depletion and tree water status, um, using our ET reports, we really, um, first of all, we kind of have to recognize that we have a system um, where the water is absorbed from the soil by the roots, travels up through the plant, is transpired out the system. And by using our ET reports, we are, trying, we are estimating based on the real-time weather around us that rate of water water vapor loss out out the plant uh, leaves, um, and then we are trying to relate it back uh, to the water holding capacities of our specific orchard soils, um, and and it's that estimate of soil moisture depletion being made with the um, based on our ET reports that can then be used to give us some idea of what the tree water status is. And again, I'll emphasize this is an, a very indirect approach to trying to get a handle on what the tree, the tree or plant water status is. So uh, to try to demonstrate, to make this continue to build this connection between our ET reports and our estimates of soil water depletion, it's really important that we get a good grasp on the plant available water concepts and and the depletion concepts. So this is a bit of a review picking up from last week, um, these next few slides. Um, so on the left, um, we see uh, basically uh, soils are porous, about 50% airspace, 50% mineral, um, and uh, organic, mostly, or mostly mineral, a little bit of organic matter. When all that pore space is full, um, if you were to use a soil moisture sensor, it measures the tension, it would, like a uh, tensiometer or a watermark that has been around for a long time and many of us are familiar with. Um, we would have around zero centibar measurement on those devices. And um, zero to about 10 to 30 centibar, depending on the soil texture. When we're in those kinds of conditions where the soil pore space is largely full of water and void of air, this is called gravitational water. Um, then um, as that water drains by gravity, um, if it's a sandier soil, it'll, it'll probably be fairly well drained by around 10 centibar. Um, if it's a heavier loam, clay loam, towards 30 centibar. Um, this is called, this is the beginning of the plant available water. This is where the soil pores are about 50% air content and 50% water content. Uh, as we progress through here, uh, we get to the bottom of the, uh, the, the lower end of the plant available water. Typically that will occur somewhere around 200 centibars for most soils. And we begin, we enter into a hygroscopic water, which is not available to plants. It's, it's so tightly bound by the soil that the plants cannot exert enough energy to get it. How this kind of progression of water availability affects the plants is, is like this. 
when we're in the saturated stage, this gravitational water, gravitational water poses uh, conditions of oxygen depletion and oxy conditions. And this is a form of harmful crop stress and potential death to our trees and to our crops. Um, very uh, risky to the root health, to the root hairs, and, to, and when the roots fail, also um, conducive to promoting certain diseases. Uh, water fungi and such. Um, the part that we're most interested in and that we're trying to manage with our water management is the plant available water. Again, it starts at around the 10 to 30 centibar. And as we move into this, we're around the 50% air, 50% water content in the soil. Uh, and we move from a condition of, of soil moisture that should provide very little to low and mild crop stress uh, and progress to where uh, we get into moderate to high crop stress. Uh, and, then, and so again, it's this level here, or this water that we are mostly interested in us in, in understanding how much is there uh, within the crop root zone and how to manage it. And typically a, a good analogy is viewing this as a gas tank, this representing the full level, this representing the empty level, this dashed line representing the half full level, sometimes it's referred to as a management threshold or management allowable depletion, and oftentimes considered around 50%. I'll show you as being a reasonable level. And so it's, it's this uh, portion of the plant available water uh, aspects that we can try to relate to our orchard or tree water status. When we get very dry we and we are in the hygroscopic range, this is where we see severe wilt crop stress that if sustained will lead to tree death. Uh, it's probably fair to say that this condition is not, this condition is not as acute as the oxygen depleted condition when it comes to tree and plant health. So the amount of plant available water depends on orchard soil characteristics and it, and it depends on the, the root volume, the root mass and distribution of the tree, which is a, a, a real uncertainty in our systems. Uh, just to go through a, a simple example of how to estimate uh, the plant available water for a orchard soil uh, west side of the Sacramento Valley. Uh, this is a, a, a farm field with a tame of silt loam. Uh, this is uh, showing using the Google Earth based uh, California Soil Resources um, web app uh, as a source of getting this information. You can uh, drill down a layer into this soil web map and it will tell you for this map unit, this soil type, uh, give you an estimate of the available water storage or uh, here it's 17.7 centimeters. Here I do the math conversion for you to get it to inches per foot soil. So 17.7 divided by 2.454 is seven inches of water and in 3.3 feet. So that equates to 2.1 inches of water. Um, in this example, um, this orchard A1, um, we want to ask ourselves the question, what, how much plant available water is available to the plant and still keep that tree water status in that 50% management threshold level or above? Um, and in this case, our experience tells us that we're working with a seven foot root zone and again with 2.1 inches of water per foot. If you do the math, you can see we have about 14.7 inches of total plant available water. Uh, we apply our 50% management threshold that tells us we have an estimate of about 7.4 inches of of plant available water to utilize in that profile. Um, assuming we've had the rainfall to refill it from the previous season. Uh, so it's a, it's a resource for us to work with. So I had to walk, revisit, kind of review that 
that aspect of, of how you uh, estimate plant available water for specific situations so that we could get to the conversation of how does that relate to plant water or to actual tree water status. What we have here is a graphic. These are actual points taken from an almond orchard on the west side of Tama County in 2016. It was actually the Tama silt loam, the example I just uh, walked through. In our case, when we used soil moisture sensors and did some studies on it, we learned that we had about eight inches of actual soil moisture available to the plant that we could use in our bank. And as we monitored tree water status using a pressure chamber, measuring stem water potential, which I'll cover next. What we found was uh, a lot of scatter uh, in this relationship in the, in the lower stress levels. These least, lower, least negative numbers indicate less tree stress, the more negative, uh, more tree stress. We see a, little, a lot of scatter, um, but what becomes apparent is even though there is a uh, there is some scatter in the data. There is an apparent trend. This best fit line tries to highlight it. And what it's showing us in this case that um, our, our tree water status, the stem water potential, seemed to change most drastically when we reached 80% or more depletion of our plant available water. Um, again, not a perfect trend by any means with a fair amount of scatter, but Nonetheless, the trend is there. Um, so if we were to try to ask ourselves, if we were to use the ET uh, tables to track our uh, um, depletion of our plant available water, if we were to use our weekly ET reports, uh, we could expect for sure when we got towards 80% depletion that we are on the fringes of probably some pretty acute and steep changes in tree water status. So for purposes for trying to set up a management threshold, we would want to be more conservative, somewhere between perhaps 50 to 70%, maybe even more conservative. And as I said last week, this is a judgment call for each irrigation manager that's going to reflect their experiences and some of their own philosophies. This is another example. This is a walnut orchard on the west side of Tama County, a place I worked in a long time ago, 2002. It's a Maywood loam. In this instance, we felt as though the, the root zone was on the order of about five feet. Uh, and here you can see the relationship between the soil water depletion um, and the, ch the change the, the pressure chamber measurements, the, the change in tree water status. Um, here the units are in bars below baseline, which I'll cover in a few minutes. But what this again shows us is that uh, in this case, uh, we were seeing, tree, we could equate soil water depletions on the order of 50 to 60% in our root zone with tree water, uh, stem water potentials or tree water status of about three bars below baseline, which we would think would are approaching levels that would be significant in terms of crop performance and health. So again, this is another real world example of where it looks like a management threshold of around 50% of the plant available water would be reasonable. So again, as you try to tie this back to your ET reports and you're looking at your cumulative ET and relating it to the water holding capacity in your soil, 50% um, when that ET adds up to about 50% of your uh, soil water availability, it would uh, suggest to be a reasonable trigger to be thinking about irrigating. So I tried to give you a couple real world examples. This is just some more general kind of um, a little bit more textbook, but even some of our uh, recent sources. This is from the uh, free online publication by Daniele Zachariah, uh, publication 8571. Uh, uh, it, he's actually referencing the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, an irrigation guide. 
and here they're suggesting for orchards, eight uh, average root depth about eight feet, and a, a management threshold or a management um, allowable depletion of 50 to 65 percent. So I thought it was interesting that some of our own local uh, field examples kind of compared well with that, uh, not knowing it at the time. So. Um, what I want to stop here for a minute is do a management or do a knowledge check um, to uh, kind of just think about what I've talked about here for a little bit. So the question is the manageable management allowable depletion MAD. Sometimes you'll see in different literature the acronym or what I've just referred to as your management threshold is an acceptable percentage of plant available soil moisture depletion used in a water budget that should not cause, cause harmful crop stress and can trigger crop irrigation. Um, consider that question and, and answer whether that's true or false. And as you answer the first question, think about the second question. What would you consider a reasonable management allowable depletion? Our management threshold for orchard crops is uh, zero, 100%, or 50 to 65%. So, uh, at least in my way of thinking and my experience, um, I, I think that the d definition for a management allowable depletion as given in the first part of question one there um, is is a reasonable definition. Um, it's the acceptable percentage of plant available soil moisture depletion that we can track with the water budget that we can let let the plant use and try to refill with irrigation or main, sustain with irrigation and that should not be too harmful to the crop and should serve as a good trigger for irrigation. Um, and yes, both in field experience and in just kind of uh, uh, various public documents, published documents, a 50 to 65% depletion seems to be pretty reasonable for orchard crop crops like we grow. Okay, so we'll continue on here. Okay, so as I've already alluded to, when we use our ET reports and uh, use a water budget, the best we can do is make a kind of an indirect assessment of, of the plant water or, or tree water status. And uh, when uh, water budgeting and ET was developed, we didn't have a lot of tools that were well developed and well understood for measuring uh, tree water status or plant water status directly. But that has changed a lot in the past few decades and will continue to change as there is considerable investment into the plant based, into plant based measurement methods to advance it into the future. So the current kind of state of the art, many of you may be familiar with it, some of you possibly using it, is the use of a pressure chamber to measure, to directly assess the tree water status or orchard water status. This is an example of one style of pressure chamber. Why, are, why do we use the pressure chamber and why are we interested in the tree water status? I kind of answered this earlier, but it measures the tree. This is what we care about most. This is what's ultimately going to pay our bills. Uh, when we use a pressure chamber, what we are doing is um, measuring what is considered to be a process, the soil plant atmospheric continuum. And what we mean by this is there's a connection between the soil, the tree, and the atmosphere. As I've already talked to you, um, when you're at the, the kind of the wet end of the plant available water, we're somewhere around 30 centibars tension in most soils, unless it's a very sandy soil, in which case it might only be 10 centibars. At that condition, the roots are um, exerting a, a energy and tension to pull this water from the soil. 
on the order of about four bars tension. The bar is a unit of measure of tension or pressure. But since, as uh, one of our professors at UC Davis says, um, trees acquire their water by a, a large sucking system, uh, uh, we are essentially measuring a vacuum or a tension from the soil up the tree. So at four bar, minus four bars, whoops, four bars tension at the root, round minus eight bars in the trunk, round minus eight and a half bars in the scaffolding, which is what we are most likely monitoring with the pressure chamber is the scaffold xylem tension. And I'll show you the technique a little bit uh, later. Um, the leaf xylem is around nine bars, not too much different than the scaffold xylem. Leaves have air spaces inside them that we can't see at the molecular level. Because of that airspace, the, um, the, le the leaf airspace tension increases to around 12 bars. The air oh, um, just very near the leaf is uh, around 70 bars tension, and the air above the tree is up around 95 bars. So we have this continuum of tension. It's progressively uh, creating a, a stronger suction or vacuum and drawing the water and driving the transpiration process. When we use the pressure chamber to measure the sca scaffold xylem, what we are doing is getting a tension measurement of the tree that's integrating the atmospheric conditions, the weather conditions around it, as well as the soil conditions of which the, the state of the, the plant available water. So in this case, the tree is the real integrator here uh, this is how it helps us cope with some of the uncertainties of not knowing what is the effective root zone uh, for sure. So here is a uh, cartoon diagram of a, a pump up pressure chamber. This is actually a style of pressure chamber that's available. What you see in this chamber is a sample leaf taken from the tree. It's taken in the lower canopy around shoulder height to the top of your head kind of thing, or at least arm reach at the most, depending on your height. Um, and you'll see that the sample leaf is inside a foil bag. This foil bag was put on the leaf while the leaf stayed on the tree, still connected to the scaffolding. Um, and it was allowed to be there for about 10 minutes. What it caused the leaf to do was to shut down transpiration, equilibrate with the scaffold xylem. So it gives you a sense of the tension of a bigger portion of the tree, not just an individual leaf. Um, you, we look through with a magnifying glass, we put pressure on this leaf, push the water that's in the leaf up the stem, and we watch for the point that the water exudes out the top of the cut surface of the stem, and we read the pressure exerted to get that water to come out of the stem. And we record that number, and that is a quantifiable measure of the stress the tree is under. This is the actual process, what it looks like. A bag leaf on a tree is an almond tree. Here, we're putting a leaf that's been cut from the tree into the pressure chamber. This is a walnut bag, a bigger leaf. Um, here, we have the, the walnut leaf inside the chamber, closed, locked in, getting ready to, or to apply the pressure, maybe applying the pressure already in this picture. Um, and we're waiting to see the end point um, of the water exuding from the stem. Here's a close-up magnified look of what the end point should look like. The, wa the xylem water just coming to the cut surface and, and we stop the device from uh, exerting more pressure at this point and we measure the pressure gauge and record our reading. So we get our readings. I'll give you a little idea of what the basic uh, interpretation is, is like. Uh, I'm going to stick strictly to almond today, and I'll give you some resources in a minute if you're interested in walnut prune. Um, and um, so what we've done is over the years, we've done research to try to calibrate what you can expect uh, when a tree lives a, a good portion of its time under certain uh, uh, orchard water status levels. And so in the case of almond, we don't see at any point, um, maybe a dormant tree, 
water, uh, stem water potentials of less than minus six bars tension. And um, our tables show minus negative numbers because it's a tension measurement that we are measuring. Um, six to minus six to minus 10, ten uh, bars tension indicates a low stress. Um, it's often an indicator of, of fully irrigated egg conditions and ideal for promoting shoot growth in almond trees. And from a standpoint of most people's goals of growing the new shoot growth, uh, filling in space uh, with new growth and, and sizing nuts, uh, this is usually suggested as pretty good, uh, a, a, a pretty good level to maintain through mid-June. 10 to 14 bars tension is considered mild to moderate stress, may appro be appropriate just before the onset of hull split, which usually occurs around the 1st of July. Uh, and then from minus 14 to minus 18 bars tension is suggested for almonds to help encourage hull split, uniform hull split for those reasons that I touched on earlier to help with hull rot, other diseases and uniformity of hull split, navel orange worm control, uh, and just efficiency of harvest. Um, we start getting above 18 bars. We're transitioning to moderate to higher crop levels of stress that can be harmful to the crop and may begin to trigger light levels of defoliation. Um, if we get into 20 to 30 bars stress, which can happen during harvest when the crop's on the ground and drying, um, this is the time that will lead to more defoliation and maybe a disruption of photosynthesis after the crop is off and storage of carbohydrates and food that affects next year's crop. And then anything more stressed than 30 bars tension uh, will lead to extensive defoliation and uh, is not encouraged. So we've, we've been working with growers for about 20 years or more uh, with uh, using the pressure chamber and stem water potential to assess orchard water stress, orchard water status. And we've learned that over time, as uh, more people use it, they ask um, more challenging questions and they learn things themselves. And so we have now progressed to where we offer kind of a simple interpretation for the beginner and an advanced interpretation for the for uh, users have been working with it longer. And we, I'd like to introduce to you for a minute the idea of what's called bars below fully, below the fully watered baseline. So this is a graphic loaned to us by Bruce Lampinen, our statewide uh, orchard crop specialist. And it kind of demonstrates what, what the plant goes through, a plant can go through each day. So depending on the irrigated, irrigation conditions, soil water conditions, it, each day a tree will go through a bell-shaped curve where uh, when the sun is just coming up and it's coming out of the nighttime, um, the tree is experiencing the least stress. Uh, this is potentially around three or four bars in the spring. Um, and then as it moves through the 24-hour period, at noontime, to about two, three o'clock, our stress levels, the tree stress levels kind of max, max, reach a maximum and are most stable. Then as the sun begins to uh, change angle and go down and approach evening, it begins to recover and will fully recover during, at, during the dark. Depending on the orchard water, the irrigation and the orchard water status, these, this, these curves will change in steepness and then in, maximum level of tension. And so the green line representing fully, more near fully watered condition, mild stress conditions, and moderate stress conditions. And this is a, over a range of scale of around three bars to 27 bars. This is a metric unit of megapascals to convert it. You just multiply by 10 to think of it in terms of bars. So that's the general idea behind what's going on with the tree water status in the course of the day. Um, what's important to us is demonstrating the, I, the concept of a fully irrigated baseline and its importance to interpreting stem water potential. 
So I've got two thermometers here. They represent two different days. On one day, the weather is 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 30% relative humidity. And with the pressure chamber, we measure 11 bars of, of tree water stress tension. On a second different day, the weather is 105 degrees, 10% relative humidity, and we measure 11 bars of stress. Um, so the question here, as this would suggest, 11 bar stress is 11 bar stress. The trees uh, feeling the same amount of tension and exerting the same amount of energy to get it, the water that it needs. The question is, which one of these two days is more attributable to our irrigation management and which one is more attributable to the just the weather and the environment of which it's growing, things that we can't really control too well. So for advanced interpretation, we offer what are called baseline tables. And this one, they are crop specific. The ranges that you measure in trees depends on the species. This is for almond. But what this suggests is that on the 90 degree day, 30% relative humidity, the kind of the best case scenario for fully irrigated um, tree water tension would be 8.2 bars. On that hotter, drier day, 105, 10% relative humidity, a fully water condition might be 12.3 bars. So if we go back to our thermometers and we play this out and ask the question, which one of these scenarios is more attributable to our irrigation management and which one's more stressed and more attributable to our irrigation management? If we work through this, you'll see that as I showed you in the table, the fully irrigated baseline stem water potential for this weather condition was 8.2 bars. We measured 11 bars. The difference in the orchard, in the orchard is 2.8 bars below baseline. If we look at the baseline on the second day, the hot dry day, fully irrigated condition is 12.3 bars. And the difference is a positive plus 1.3 bars over the, the fully irrigated baseline. So in terms of interpreting these numbers, these trees are at the same water tension and stress, but th because it was uh, this occurred on a cooler, more humid day, this is suggesting this stress was created more by our irrigation management and the, the orchard approaching need for irrigation than over here. This appears to be more created by the hot, windy conditions that we don't have much control of. And in fact, these trees are probably have been recently irrigated. That's why they are below this uh, baseline estimate. And it would be probably harmful, if it not least futile, to try to add water to reduce this orchard stress in this situation potentially harmful by creating anoxy conditions for the orchard. So this kind of introduces the idea of using the pressure chamber to, in, to assess tree water status uh, together or uh, directly, as opposed to trying to use a water budget and an assessment of our plant available soil water storage. Um, we have a series of, of uh, uh, articles on our Sacramento Valley Orchard site. It's in the manual section of the website that talks about uh, this whole concept of stem water potential. We have the interpretation for the beginner. We've got information on where to get them, how to use them, and then we have interpretive advanced interpretive guidelines for each crop, walnut, almond, and prune. So um, I'd like to pose another checkpoint to just think about what I've talked about here a little bit. The question is day A, almond orchard water status measured 11 bars. The fully irrigated baseline was 8.2 bars. Day B, the orchard water status was 11 bars. But afternoon fully irrigated baseline was 12.3 bars. Which day indicates irrigation might be approaching?
Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and close the polling. And uh, let's just see if we can just remember, we'll review this again in just a second more closely, but it seemed as though the majority of people thought day A um, was the day that was indicating irrigation may be most likely approaching, and they estimated that the uh, uh, tree water status to be 2.8 bars below baseline. Let's take a look. Um, now, I don't know. I could be accused of not being very creative here, but I tried to keep it simple for you. Essen essentially, I represented re the, quest the question that we talked about earlier, the example. So um, the correct answer is B. Um, well, let me back up. The correct answer was B at with the minus 2.8 bars below baseline. And again, this is essentially the, the situation. On the cooler day with a higher relative humidity that had the same water stress as the hotter day and drier relative humidity, the pressure chamber and the measurement technique essentially points out that 2.8 bars for the cooler day below baseline and actually above baseline. And so again, this just reinforces that what we were seeing here is more stress on the cooler day, which suggests that had to do with the, ir the soil moisture conditions, the tree water status, and the need for irrigation approaching, where on this day, whoops, on this day, it was drier, hotter, um, our actual measured orchard stem water potential was positive above baseline um, that we would estimate based on our model and our table. And so that even though this, the tension levels are the same, this is more due related to irrigation. This is more due to just the hot environmental can drive environmental conditions that we really couldn't control and i'd re-emphasize that when it's above when the field measurement is above the baseline it's suggesting that it has been recently irrigated the tree has recovered some and it's recovered as much as it can given the hot dry extreme conditions and it would probably very be at best be futile possibly harmful to think, interpret this as needing irrigation and re-irrigating. Okay, we're closing in on the end of our hour. I wanna spend the last uh, working on, just kind of talking about pairing a water budget uh, with tree water status. Okay, and they're very different approaches, yet they bring, each bring different strengths and 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 to, to the to the table for us to use um, with the water budget it's low cost once we learn how to use the information and, and tie it together uh, with our soils information um, with the pressure chamber and tree water status our best estimates are it costs about 10 to 20 dollars per acre to measure somewhat routinely with the pressure cha chamber during an irrigation season a water budget indicates how much water is leaving an orchard for a specific period and weather conditions. The tree water status indicates the tree water status is within levels that tree health, growth, and productivity perform to, to tell whether they will perform to meet our expectations. Okay. Um, Water budget informs the question whether the sum of the irrigation water, in-season rainfall, and soil storage is within reason to supply the crop's needs. The tree water status being the integrator that it is, the measurement of the tree, it informs the challenging question of effective root zone. And it helps us to optimize our irrigation costs, particularly if we can make use of managed moderated deficit irrigation to get specific responses that we're looking for. Suggestions for pairing the two methods together. 
use tree water status to, as a primary gauge to trigger the first irrigation of the season. Compare the cumulative ET from our ET reports to, the est to estimate the depletion of, of your plant available water for your specific orchard soil. In the best case scenario, both tree water status, the measurements of the pressure chamber, and the water budget suggest similar timing to apply the first irrigation. But this is not always the case, and I'll show you some examples. Um, once irrigation is occurring routinely, it may be adequate to simply match the weekly ET rate with irrigation, and then follow up or continue to monitor the tree water status through the season um, as regularly as you can, um, even if it's only every once every couple of weeks um, to, to see if, you're, you're, if your ET-based scheduling is keeping you in the ranges that you want. Um, if trending too dry, increase irrigation above the weekly ET rate. Um, if ten, trending too wet, cut the irrigation back less than the weekly ET rate. Uh, seek to keep the tree water status within optimum ranges as much as possible to, to get the tree to perform the way you want it to. Whether if you're in a part of the season you want to promote shoot growth, then you might manage, manage differently than if you're in a part of the season that you're wanting to promote hull split or sugar accumulation in fruit. Uh, these, these are the considerations that you have to uh, consider as your own manager. At the end of the season, compare all water supplied to the seasonal cumulative ET to see if they are within a reasonable balance. If there is a large discrepancy, if a large discrepancy occurs between the water budget and tree water status, one, it may indicate that the effective root zone and source of plant available water is different usually greater than initially assessed with the water for the water budget. Also, double check your pressure chamber operation for good technique and val valid tree water status measurements. So here's a couple case studies. These are two orchards in the Tehama County area, Orchard 28 uh, and Orchard 11. From the aerial photos, you can see they look to be pretty nicely uniform orchards, no obvious uh, uh, big holes or problems. Um, orchard 28 is what we consider kind of west of the river, moving up into our terrace soils where we have more soil variability as indicated by all these uh, soil contour lines. It has two soil types, a mode alone, and a Perkins gravelly loam um, moving through here. Uh, in 2019, we monitored the applied water and the ET, conducting a water budget. And uh, you can see that the ET very close, or the applied water very closely mimicked the ET and was within about uh, five inches of uh, four or five inches, uh, uh, a difference that the soil storage that should have easily covered the combination of in-season rainfall, particularly in 2019. When you uh, look at the pressure chamber measurements, which are I just brought up on the right, this is the trend line and bars below fully irrigated baseline. Here's your zero baseline mark. What it's showing is that through most of July, we kept the tree water status within about six bars of the fully irrigated baseline. Most of the time, with, or much of the time within four bars. Uh, as we approached hull split and then harvest, you can see it tailed off. And by the end of uh, early October, uh, coming out of the harvest, because there were three, three varieties in the orchard, uh, there was a fair amount of stress. Uh, and so um, you can see that despite being close to ET, there, there was a fair amount of stress. Now, the interesting thing about this orchard, this is, was a, particularly for the 2019 season, this was a very well yielding orchard. Um, and it was a, a well above average for the year. And so even though there was stress, um, and 
ET and applied water was close to ET. Um, I, it was fair to say it was uh, a pretty good situation and um, the grower was pleased with the performance of the orchard. The second orchard, Orchard 28, is a Columbia silt loam. It's a little bit closer to the river. Uh, look, I can't move that so you can see it. Uh, this orchard is, would be described as an orchard that it, these trees are very vigorous, um, quite tall, um, and, uh, and this is a class one soil, often a soil that we would grow walnuts on. Here you can see that the applied water was much less, less than 25 inches, while the ET was up towards 45 inches, so about a 20 inch difference in applied water. And here, interestingly enough, when we look at the pressure chamber measurements, the uh, tree water status, this orchard, for the most part, despite being applied, receiving less applied irrigation water, it uh, was under far less stress than the other uh, orchard 11 uh, for most of the season. And so it, it points to how working the two uh, techniques together can be informative. In this case, uh, this orchard did not yield as well as the other orchard. The point of trying to pair these up is to put together the, the strengths of each, the uh, pressure chamber or the tree water status, plant-based sensors um, to as the integrator, and then the water budget to kind of give you a handle whether everything is lining up. And hopefully when they're paired together, you uh, get a fuller view and can make more informed decisions. So uh, we're closing in on the end of the hour. Um, last question, why might an irrigation manager pair ET water budget information uh, with pressure chamber measurements of orchard water status to help guide irrigation decisions? Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll. So the point of this question was just to try to reinforce that um, the ET information, the water budgeting um, is a, a very different perspective than the plant-based measurement uh, with the pressure chamber or any other device that might come our way in the future. Um, I think it, you can see how they do both, they show very different pictures and I'm hoping from this you can see where there may be value in using both to have both perspectives. We got yeah. a, a question, um, if you wouldn't mind, um, for folks who want to stay on for another minute or two, if you could circle back to sure. the field 28 example and explain yes. what might be behind the disparity between the two methods. Yeah, okay. So the question is the idea behind the disparity of the two methods. How, how can an orchard be irrigated 20 inches under ET and be less stressed than the previous orchard that was irrigated very close to ET? Okay. Uh, we've had this experience before, especially on these kinds of a, a Columbia soil series is a class one series. Um, what it starts to point out to you is that um, two things, that that, roots, that effective root zone can be much deeper than we might expect. It's not necessarily mean that we have roots 10, 15, 20 feet deep. We don't know that we don't, but it can also be capillary influences of water moving from sh deeper depths um, to drier soils above it. Um, and we experience this quite a bit when we get into close, into those true alluvial soils that are in closer proximity to our rivers and tributaries, okay? And so I think that begins to explain why um, uh, we had lower stress with the pressure chamber and much less water, whereas the other soil that's up on the terrace, it's, it's a probably class uh, twos, possibly Perkins, maybe a class three soil, um, not nearly the water holding capacity, 
um, not as uh, 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 easy for water to infiltrate, and percolate. Um, and so um, just the natural condition poses stresses. <clears throat> now, why, why does the, the um, one orchard yield better than the other? That's a little tougher question, but we, um, it's, it's one uh, that uh, we, we think has to do with the case of the, this orchard being very vigorous. Um, it could be a case, too much shading, not, a, not enough light. Essentially a case where the crop became too vegetative opposed to being more production oriented. Um, uh, producing the fruit opposed to shade and 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 limbs and so uh anyway so that's kind of the contrast we get here um the putting the two tools together though improves your chances at kind of finding the optimum management for best performance um, and at the same time uh, managing your costs and your resources as effectively as and bottom line uh, improving your 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 revenue your your take home um, so um, that's that's my thoughts on on the differences. Any other question related to that? So it sounds like okay a uh, shallower yeah. water table than expected, and also uh, roots exploring a larger volume of soil than was originally estimated. Yeah. I don't know positively, but other orchards in that vicinity, it's not uncommon to find what, uh, standing water at around 20, 25 feet. Um, and so, um, and those being true, very deep alluvial soils, um, one, you will get deeper roots, and two, um, you just have more capillary movement from the moisture soils below to the ones that are being dried out by the crop water use above. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions? So our next tutorial will be two weeks out and there we will concentrate on how to use our weekly ET tables and adjust so that we can use them for uh, young developing orchards. And I'll try to provide some specific information for almond, walnut, and prune. So uh, thank you for your time. Have a wonderful Friday and a great weekend. And uh, hope to see you in a couple of weeks or uh, talk to you. Thanks.